Good morning. Still morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, we are looking at sermon preparation and execution. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint for you, but if you would like a copy of my notes, you can come see me afterward, and I will give you a copy of my notes. In fact, you can actually put Brother Josiah's PowerPoint up there because that's exactly the same thing that we will be looking at. Um, as he was speaking, uh, I was going through my notes, and it looks exactly the same. So a lot of it is exactly the same, uh, but we will go through it again. Um, repetition is, is good. Repetition is important. It helps us remember. Um, so, okay, let's get into it. Um, before we start preparing our sermons, before we get into actually doing the work, there are certain things that we have to do. All right, so in order to start that process, what's the first thing that we do? You can interact with me, you can speak with me, you can give me answers. The first thing that we do is we pray, like Brother Josiah had mentioned, okay? Um, so before we even start the process, we have to pray. Um, there are certain things um, that happen within us when we pray, okay? Um, if we, so we pray for wisdom. Wisdom comes from God, Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 6, and I'm going to read that. For the, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. James chapter 1 and verses 5. Uh, which Brother Josiah also mentioned, James 1, 5. I'm going to read that for us as well. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given unto him. So the reason, that, one of the reasons that we pray is to ask God for wisdom. We are about to embark on something very important. Okay, and whatever we say, if it doesn't come from God, then it's not as valuable. Okay, I'm not going to say it doesn't have any value, right? but if it's not from God's word, then it doesn't have as much value. So the first thing that we do is we pray because it gives us wisdom. The next thing or the next reason that we ought to pray, I'm going to go to Proverbs chapter 4, and I'm going to read verses 7. Sorry, not Proverbs, Philippians. Don't know why. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7, and that tells us, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So, we pray and we ask God for wisdom. But we pray and we ask God to calm our hearts, to calm our minds, to give us um, clear minds. So that when we read and we, we, we read through his word, he helps us understand what we are reading. He helps us, gives us clarity in order to understand what we are reading and whatever we are reading, um, that we can produce it in such a way that the brethren will understand what we are saying and that they will get the intended meaning. So we pray for wisdom. We pray so that we can have calmness of soul to prepare our mind and when we, when we pray, we start to realize certain things. Okay? We realize the seriousness of what we are doing. Another passage that Josiah mentioned was um, James chapter 3 and verses 1. And it tells us, not many of us should become teachers. Why? Because the consequence is going to be greater if I taught someone wrong. So, the job that you are about to embark on it's very serious. Okay? We need to realize the important, importance of it, the seriousness of it. It's God's work that I'm about to do. And it's not for, for my glory. It is for the benefit of his kingdom. Okay? So um, in, in praying, I realize it's not about me. In praying, I realize um, it's about him, his work, his glory. In praying... Um, I ask for wisdom in praying, uh, calms my mind, calms my, my heart. Um, so, so those are the things that happen when we pray. My second point, um, and this is all before we start with our, our preparation. My second point is don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Okay. Uh, so when I, was, when I was younger, this happened to me more frequently. Now it doesn't happen so much. Uh, but it seemed that every time I needed to get up into the pulpit, something happens, right? Uh, maybe something happens at home, 
um, and now I feel I'm dealing with this. I'm not in the right frame of mind. Um, I, I don't want to be in the pulpit this week. Or, or something happens at work or something, something, something just seems to happen every time. Now, um, life happens all the time, okay? There's always things happening. And I think maybe because this task is ahead of you, you start to take note of it a bit more. Uh, but there's always things happening. And the fact that these things are taking place in your life right now should not be something that discourages you from standing in the pulpit. Okay? Um, I've had brother send me a message and say, you know what, I'm on for Lord's Supper this week, but this is happening and I just, I can't prepare this week. My mind is just not in the right space. Um, so, I'm sure that happens to a lot of us, but we should never be discouraged because of these challenges that we go through. Be reminded, everyone's going through something. Okay? Uh, your audience, they are experiencing challenges. Um, they are going through something. They... Maybe you're going through this experience so that you can relate to those who you're going to speak with. Okay? Um, the audience that you are speaking to are probably going through things that's much worse even than what you are currently going through this week. They need to hear what you have to say. Okay? So don't be discouraged just because certain things are taking place. Use it as fuel because these are not the experiences that you can use as you relate to your audience. Okay, and then maybe another thing to mention, um, a preacher's life is not easy. So, um, the preacher stands up there. The preacher had challenges in this week. There were things that were going on that he had to deal with. Um, there were things that, that were said to him that he just has to put in his pocket now and present this, this lesson. There are things going on, but you know what? He still has to stand up and encourage. Um, so, let's, let's just take that, whatever's going on, Use that as fuel as we present what needs to be presented. Use your experiences to make you a better vessel for God's work. Um, the next one, um, remove distractions. Remove distractions. Okay. Um, Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to go there. Matthew chapter 7 from verses 1 through verses 6. Judge not, that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, um, will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take out the speck of your eye when there is a log in your own eye, you hypocrite? And it continues. But the, the main thought that I want us to see in this passage is if there is something in my eye, I'm no, I'm no, imagine a log in your own eye, you are not capable of taking something else out of somebody else's eye because you just can't see. If we can see that imagery, if there is certain challenges that I'm dealing with and I'm talking about sin, if there are certain sins in my life, it becomes very difficult in order for me to preach about certain things because now I can't preach about it because I'm doing it. So um, I need to remove certain things to prepare myself for the task that's at hand. Okay, so remove the sin that's in our lives. Um, Ephesians chapter four, if you're making notes, Ephesians chapter four from 25 through 32, um, things that we remove, things that we need to add into our lives. Okay, um, so the, the next point there is remove. Um, so before we even start this process of sermon preparation, we pray. We don't allow ourselves to be discouraged because of the things that's going on. And we remove distractions that will prevent us from seeing clearly as we go into what we are about to do. Okay, so the next part um, is the actual work. Okay, so here is the actual work. And the first thing that you are going to have to do is to choose a topic. Okay, so the first thing you must do is choose a topic. Um, and... Sermons are, are sometimes textual or topical. Um, textual, um, so we'll pick a certain passage, uh, maybe Acts chapter 2, it was mentioned earlier, and now you go through all the verses and you take out from that certain passage all the points that you want us to learn, okay? Um, that's how I do a lot of my sermons. It's also how I teach my Bible studies. Um, 
So that is textual and you get topical where you choose a topic, uh, you maybe say love, um, and then you choose different verses that go along with that topic. Okay, uh, both of these are okay, both of these are good, both of the, them have their, um, their time and their purpose. Um, but when you do topical, um, it's very dangerous. Okay, when you do topical, it's very dangerous because um, when you start pulling passages from different places, make sure that you are still using them within context. Okay, um, I'll get to that a bit later as I talk about studying. Um, but topical, just when you take these passages, don't just take a passage without having read the context, without having read the chapter, without having read the book. Because it will be, become very easy to make the Bible say anything that you want it to say if you start just grabbing verses from here and from there. Okay? So um, when you choose a topic or when you, you are choosing your topic, you must decide do you want to be textual, do you want to be topical. Um, allow, as you choose your topic, allow life to assist you as you are choosing this topic. Okay? So I'm saying be observant. Okay, so you observe your own life, your own um, challenges, the own, your own struggles, what you are going through. Be observant, look around, take note of those things. Um, take note of the things that the brethren is experiencing. Okay, so um, we spoke about that earlier. We need to be in, our, in each other's lives so that I know what you are going through. You know what I'm going through. That helps me as I choose my topic because it tells me what the, the brethren need to hear. Okay, so be observant, um, take note of what's happening in the world, right? In our communities, in our country, in the, in the, in the greater world, um, know what's happening because these are the things that will guide us. This is what's on everyone's mind, okay? So um, when I choose, I must be observant, I must know what's happening, I must know what's going on. Um, yeah, know, know your audience. Um, it is very important that you, you know where the brethren are before you can just teach any topic. What I mean when I say that, so um, there's a concept within education that's called scaffolding. And what that is, um, it, you, you build a framework around what is currently known in order to build up your learners into a place where you want them to be. Okay, I'm a school teacher, if you didn't know. Okay, um, so what I'm saying is, I need to know where your understanding is right now so that I can bring you up to where I want you to be, okay? So I need to know my audience. And again, it goes back to being with the brothers and being with the brethren, spending time with the church, right? So that I know where you are and then I can raise you to where we all need to be. And don't, don't, be, don't be so stuck on that topic, okay? It's not set in stone. Um, because as you, start, as you start looking at different passages and as you start looking at um, different verses and as you, as you go into your study, you might want to change that. And I've changed my topic so many times when I was halfway through the lesson and then I'm like, okay, uh, I'm thinking different things now. Let's just put this aside. Maybe I'll even use that material later on and then I just go somewhere else. Okay, that's fine. It's all valuable. It's all useful. Don't be so set in stone unless the congregation that uh, invited you gave you a topic, then you, I guess you kind of have to use that. Um, but it's not set in stone. And it, it also becomes very dangerous when you, you want to um, tie yourself to that topic that you chose because now you're making, the, you're making these things apply to that topic that you, you chose. So nothing is set in stone with regards to the topic. Allow yourself to be flexible. And as you, as you go through this process, allow your thoughts to guide where you want the, the brethren to be. Okay, so the first one, choose a topic. Um, and as we choose a topic, we choose a title as well. Okay, sometimes I only choose the title of my lesson at the end of it. Um, but, but choose a topic, choose a title. Um, the next point that I've got for us over there is to choose a key passage. Okay, so even if you are doing textual, um, within that text, choose a singular, singular passage. And that passage is going to encapsulate the greater thought of what you want to bring across to the brethren. Okay, so now I'm going to give us something to do because I've been talking a lot and I usually don't like to talk so much. So um, we are all going to uh, page in our Bibles. I hope you have a Bible, yeah? To Matthew chapter 5. From verses 13 through 16. Okay, so um, I'm sure we know the passage that speaks, uh, says you are the salt of the earth and it continues. 
Um, I will read it in a second, but I'm going to make an example, and I have chosen this as the key passage for my lesson, okay? So now what I want us to do, and we are going to do this, and you are going to interact, and you're going to give me your answers. Um, I want us to look at this passage, and with 15 words or less, 10 words or less, I want you to give me the total idea that you want to bring across to the brethren from this passage. Okay, so we're just going to break this up very short. We're going to read through it and we're going to say, okay, after reading this, this is what I want to tell the brethren. Okay, so we have some work to do now. Uh, Matthew chapter 5 from 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a, light, on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So let's try. Um, I'm, let's give, I'm going to give you a minute, two minutes maybe. I'll time you. Um, and I want you to try and summarize this passage just in 15 words or less. If this is my key passage, what is the main idea that I want to bring across to the brethren? Okay, we've got two minutes. And I just chose five words when I did mine. What we do glorifies God. What we do glorifies God. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Ensure your Christianity is visible. Ensure your Christianity is visible. I like that one. Anyone else? Yep. I think three three things for me. Uh, influence, uh, salt, and flavor. We must influence. Uh, we must be visible. Uh, that is what light does. It makes things visible. Also gives direction. And then the sum total is to glorify God. That is the end product of all glorify of Glorify God. Yeah. Okay, so I, I think I could correct you a bit more than 15 words. So <laughs> let's just say <laughs> um, how I ought to glorify God. Okay, so um, there, there's, there's definitely a lot in there. And when you do uh, break down your lesson and make, make your different points, you can mention all these things. Um, but if I were just to give a, a very brief idea of what I want to tell the brethren when I look at those verses is what I ought to be. Okay, so that, that's the one that I came up with. It's, just, it's very short. It's just, um, this is my passage. And from that passage, that's the main idea that I want to bring across to the brethren. Okay, um, and there's not one right answer here because we read the same passage and there's so much lessons from that same passage. Um, but everything else that I develop is going to link with my idea that I just mentioned now. So when I talk about that salt and when I talk about that light, I'm going to link it with what I ought to be as a Christian. And I'm going to speak about the influence and I'm going to speak about all these other things. Okay, so that was just a, a very quick two minute exercise for us. So we, in choosing our key passage. Um, the next point that we have over here is to study. The next point is to study. I can't speak about something that I do not know. Okay? And I think Josiah made a similar point. Um, if you don't know, you can't speak. So if I need to talk about a topic and I haven't done sufficient preparation, it's going to be seen when I stand up there. 
Okay? And if I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm going to be rambling and I'm going to end up wasting all of our time. Study is important. Um, I had a lecturer along the way and what he said was, um, he's not better. He was teaching us math and he was saying he's not better at math than any of us. But he simply spent more time with it. All right? And I like that. Um, so the person that is standing in front of you is not better than you at anything. But maybe they've just simply spent more time with that. Okay? Um, so where I am in my secular field right now, I, can, you can, I teach math at the high school. You can give me almost any um, mathematical topic and I can teach it off the cuff. Why? Because I've spent so much time in preparation. Okay? Um, so I'm, I'm not saying that we, can, that we should feel that we're ever at a point scripturally where we can just um, speak off the cuff. Um, but we spend so much time that when we hear a topic, we know about the topic. Okay? So when it comes to our lesson and our, our uh, preparation, put in the time. There, there's, there's no substitute for time. There's no way around time, okay? So we do have to put in the time. Um, so that's the first point over there, understudy, uh, put in the time. Um, my next point, understudy, there are certain things that um, you should look at, okay? Um, these things are valuable. Um, I'm not saying that you have to look at them, but certain things that I do look at, um, and definitely the commentaries will help you here. Uh, but the different things that I want you to look at is the first one is ethos. Um, which speaks about the culture, the climate, the atmosphere, um, the circumstances of the people. So um, when I look at my, my passage, and maybe, I'm, maybe we're talking about the Corinthian church, and now we need to think first, um, what was the circumstances in Corinth at that time? Okay? Understanding those kind of things helps us understand why the author uses certain words that he uses and certain concepts that he uses. Okay? So we, we look at what was happening around in Corinth. We look at the audience, we look at the people, and we see, okay, they were Jewish people, or maybe they were Greek people. So when we look at um, John chapter 1, for instance, understanding those kind of things, understanding who the audience was, helps us to understand why um, John writes in the way that he writes. So John chapter 1, uh, just an example for us quickly, um, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Greek word used there is... Logos, that's a, a favorite, right? Everyone knows Logos. Um, so, to the Greek, that meant something. To the Jew, that meant something else. When John writes, and we know John's book was a, bit of a, a later book than the other Gospels. When John writes his Gospel, um, he's writing to more of a Jewish audience, or not, sorry, more of a Greek audience, and he knows that, which is why he's using this particular word in the way that he does. Okay, um, if I, let me spend some more time on that. So, um, for, the, for the, the Greek, they had this idea of logos. They had this idea of the word. They knew there was something out there. Okay, they didn't know what it was. They knew that there was something out there in the universe that connected everything. Right? That was the reason all things hold together. They had this idea. They just didn't know what to call it. So, they called it word. And when John writes, he plays on that understanding that they have of word. That's one of the aspects too, that there's so much more in there. Okay? But I'm saying there are certain things that we will learn, certain things of value, that we can only understand when we know the ethos, the circumstances, um, the climate, the um, atmosphere, the audience. Okay? So there's certain, certain things that add value that we can only know when we look at that. So we look at the, the ethos, we look at the author, we look at the audience, we look at language. Um, now language is very, very important. Language is very funny. Um, I was having a, a discussion with um, Wade over there at the back, and we were talking about the word irregardless. What is irregardless? So we know what, what regardless is. Regardless is without regard, right? Regardless. What is irregardless? Well, it's a word now, which means the same thing as regardless. So, um, just because everyone always has used that incorrect version of the word, now it's a word. 
You'll find it in the dictionary. Um, and that's the beauty of language. Language evolves, right? Um, we use certain words today that mean something different 50 years ago, right? Um, and that's the beauty of language. Language evolves. La the, the, the meanings of the words have maybe changed or there are now new meanings to certain words. And for us, this is important because scripture was written with an intended meaning, with an in intended um, understanding of certain words at that time. Okay. That's why it's so important for us to look at the original, to look at the Greek, to understand okay, when they read Logos, this is what they understood. Okay? So language, very important. So look at the, look at the words. Um, we don't have to get very technical, extremely technical, where we look at the Greek so much. Okay? There is definitely value in that, um, and there's a place for that. I like the Greek very much. Um, but don't be afraid just because you see all these Greek letters, okay? Um, like the Bible Hub, that's one that I use, and I've mentioned it um, later on in my notes. Um, it makes it very easy, okay? Um, so there is, there is um, resources that we can use that makes it easy. But look at language. Language is very important. Our next point under study is read. Okay, there, there's no getting around this one as well. Read. So read the text read around the text so you read before the text you read after the text read the chapter read all of the text read the book read okay um so you uh, uh, when we look at god's word um we need to we need to put god's word right on top right so this is god's word uh, under God's word, let's maybe say the, the book that we're looking at. Under the book, let's say the chapter. Under the chapter, let's say the text that we are specifically looking at. And right at the bottom, we place ourselves. Okay? So when we want to get an idea, it has to pass through all of this before I can build my idea. Am I painting a good picture for us? Okay? So the, the word, the book, the chapter, the text itself, all of that. It has to go through that before I build what I want to say out of the text. The opposite of that is when I put myself on top and I've basically got a fishing rod and I'm throwing my fishing rod into the word and I'm just pulling up whatever I want. Okay, so, so that's what we should not do. Okay, so when, when we build our, our lessons, make sure that we, we read. Read the text. Read before the text, read after the text, read the chapter, read the book. Okay? Um, that's the only way that we will proper, properly get the context. Because again, like I mentioned before, we can get the Bible to say anything that we want it to say if we don't do that. Okay? So read. Um, the next one, draw out the original. When I say original, oh, we look at all of those things. So draw out the original intended meaning of the passage. Okay? And after we do that, now we see what application is there for me. What can I now learn after understanding all of these things? Okay, so draw, the, draw out the original meaning and then how does that apply to me today? Um, another point here, be careful that you don't decide what the passage means before you read the passage. Or, or you don't decide what the passage means before you do the work. Okay? Let me give an example. Um, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. That verse, as soon as I read that verse, automatically my mind goes to, okay, I'm defending instrumental worship. That's a, like, I don't think about anything else. I'm, I, I can read the chapter, and the chapter is maybe leading me in a certain way, but I read that verse, ah, okay, we're using that to defend instrumental worship. Back to my reading. So, I have already predetermined and predecided what that verse is all about. This is very dangerous for us. Now, I understand why we do that, because we are sometimes so caught up in defending. And we, so my, my point is this, don't be so caught up in defending that you run to the other extreme and you only see the verse as that. Okay, so um, do the work, and then based on all that you have done, then we draw our conclusion and we see, okay, 
what was the intended meaning, the original meaning there, and what is it that I'm drawing out of this now? Okay, um, so those are the points that I have under study. Okay, then definitely there are some external resources that we can look at. Um, and again, um, the Bible Hub app, that, or the website, I use the website, it's, it's very useful for different versions. Okay, so if you just type in um, the chapter that, or the verse that you want to look at, um, so type in John chapter 1 verses 1, um, and you go to the Bible Hub website, and then, you know what it will do for you? It will give you that verse in all the, well, maybe not all, but in many different versions. So now you don't have to, I know some of us are still very hard bound, uh, so we like the hard copies. We don't have to open uh, five different Bibles. We can just scroll down the page and then I can read it in the NIV, the ESV, the ASV, the FBI, did you say Uncle Craig? <laughs> so I can, I can read it in all of those different versions. On, on the, there's, there's very good resources um, at our disposal. Reading different versions are important. Okay, um, there are definitely certain versions which I tend to hoard more than other versions, and I can give you reasons for that. However, there is value in reading even the versions that I don't like. Um, I don't know if you know the Good News translation. It's not. It's not a. That's not a translation. I think that's a very bad word. There, it's a paraphrase. Okay, so what that means is they don't translate word for word, but they, they read five verses and they think, okay, it means this, and then they write it like that. Um, and now you're looking at me very strangely, but we actually kind of do that also. Don't we do that? When we read the passage and then we try and summarize the passage, that's what they're doing there. Just be very aware that that is a paraphrase when you do read a version like that. Okay? Um, so then there are versions that are more trusted. There are versions that are more difficult. I'm not going to read the King James because I'm going to struggle. And then I'm not going to understand what I'm reading. Um, and be aware that the congregation will feel the same as well. So sometimes I know there's, there's certain brothers uh, who still love the King James very much. Um, I'm not telling you to move away from that. But I'm telling you that if you read a passage and it's very difficult to understand, if you stand in the pulpit and you read it, the church is not going to understand. So, fine, read it, but then in your notes, add that same verse in a different version. So you can read that version as well to bring the brothers with you, bring the, the brethren with you. Okay? So don't, don't read it, and then we're all very confused, and then we just lose the point that you're trying to make there. So versions, um, read different versions, they add a lot of value, they help you see the same passage in different ways. Um, Based on the Greek, they are certain that I will tend toward more than others, but there's value in all of them. Um, commentaries, okay? Um, commentaries are very good. But can you see that I listed commentaries here after all of the study work? So I'm only going to look at the commentary after I've done everything else. So when I want to prepare my lesson, the first thing that I do is not pick up a commentary. That's not going to be the first thing. That will be the last thing that I do. Once I have done all the work, if I go read something that doesn't make sense, I'm going to know because I've done the work. Okay? Um, just to, because we spoke about commentaries a bit earlier. That's not your first thing that you do. That's not the first resource you pick up. Okay? You do all the work. You read the, the, the passage. You read the context. You read everything so that when you pick up a commentary and you read um, 1 Corinthians chapter... 13 verses 1, which speaks about tongues of angels. And now someone says, yeah, there are tongues of angels we can speak in. You know, that can't be true. The context doesn't speak about that. Because you read around the passage. You read the verse after, the verse before. You read the chapter. Okay? So, if you've done the work, it becomes easier for you to see error in other people's work. So the commentary, it's very valuable, but it's not the first thing that you do. Um, there are some good commentaries that I look at. Um, there's a website, and I'm going to mention the website. You saw I mentioned some, uh, but it's the studylight.org. That's a very good website if you're making notes, studylight.org. It's got a lot of different commentary, commentaries by different commentators. Um, one of my favorites is Kaufman. Um, he was a member of the church. Okay? Very good, very sound things that he, that he puts out there, or that he put out there. Studylight.org, very good resource. And then also, I watch YouTube. Um, there, there's very good stuff there. Um, there are church 
brothers who are putting things out on YouTube. So um, don't be afraid to look at that. I think Uncle Derek's got stuff on YouTube. Go watch Uncle Derek's videos. Um, there's other brothers. There's, the, there's one of the um, pages that I look at. It's called Let the Bible Speak. Um, this guy, he, he goes through the Bible on very different topics, uh, but it's, it's Church of Christ. It's Bible-based. It's very good. Let the Bible speak. Um, there's another one also, Church of Christ, uh, Bible Talk TV. Um, but there's many others, and I'm sure um, those who do use um, YouTube can give you many other names to look at. Um, but that's just some of the ones that I look at. There's a lot of resources out there, and it is just becoming easier for us to get our hands on these things. Okay, so don't be, don't be shy to go on YouTube and to search for something. And I think it's, well, it's sometimes I drive in the car and I'm, I'm playing a YouTube video and I'm learning something while I'm driving instead of just listening to the talk on the radio. Okay? So there's, there's a lot of external resources that is of value for us. Um, my next point, I just have two more points. Um, and then I must go into executing, killing the sermon. Um, so the next one is to make points. So I said make three points. Um, someone said the sermon is supposed to have seven points. I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's a set amount of points. But from your text, make your points. Okay. So if we looked at um, Matthew chapter five, which we read earlier, your first point can be salt. And then under salt, you can list the properties of salt and how understanding those properties helps us understand what kind of Christian we ought to be. And then another point can be the light and how understanding that can, and then another point can be, um, what was the last one? Um, let your light so shine so that God can get the glory. So your last point can be giving God the glory in everything. Okay, so that's just maybe three quick points there out of that passage there. There's your sermon for tomorrow. Okay, um, so salt, light, uh, giving God the glory. Make these points. It helps us have a structure to our lesson. And then we'll talk about those different points. Um, your points should have scripture. Your points should have an example. Your points should have an application. Okay, so our lessons need to be saturated in scripture. You can't put too much scripture in your lesson. I don't, I don't know if anyone's ever had that complaint and there was too many verses. Um, your lesson must be saturated in scripture. We can have two little verses, definitely. And I've heard people speak with very few verses. And then I thought to myself, this guy should be a motivational speaker, not a preacher. Okay, so um, saturate, have your scripture, have your lesson full of, 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 of um, scripture. Um, one, of my, one, of, one of the things that I pray before I stand up is that whatever I say, uh, must be found valuable to those who hear. And if it is covered in God's word, then definitely it will be, because God's word has value always. Okay, so saturate your lesson in scripture. The next one, um, have examples. Um, examples can come from scripture, it can come from personal experiences, um, but examples, um, they, they tie these abstract things to reality. Okay, so have examples, tell stories. Um, be a storyteller. People tend to, um, con to continue to listen to you when you tell stories. Okay, so have examples. Um, and then the last one, every point must have application. Okay? And also yeah, in my notes, I wrote the words, so what? And Josiah added up there as well. So every point must have a so what? So you're telling me this, so what now? Okay, so I'm making this point, what now? So what? Okay. And that so what must be something that provokes us into action. It must be something that is going to make me think about what I'm doing. It must be something that will make me think about what I have done and what I need to do about those things that I have done. Okay? That so what must be something that will push me into action. Um, and then just that application, make it real and make it relevant. Um, the last point that I have under here is... Um, conclusion. So your lesson must have, you normally say that a lesson has an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. Strictly speaking, I guess it does. Um, I, I don't really stick to that very much. But um, someone once said, in your introduction, you tell them what you're going to tell them. In your body, you tell them. In your conclusion, you 
tell them what you told them. Um, so um, our introduction it, it shouldn't be long. Um, it should be that, that, that one sentence that we had there um, that encapsulated the section that we were talking about. Okay, in our body, there we break down all the points and we tell them everything um, in there. And then in our conclusion, the conclusion doesn't, the conclusion should not be the whole lesson again. So don't now tell me every single thing that you did already tell me. Uh, but we summarize it um, and make um, special emphasis then again on the application. Because as you close your lesson, that application, that so what, is what needs to be lingering in the mind. Okay? Um, we, we normally have, when we end our, our, our sermons, we have this invitation. Right? And I think that's also like something for us to talk about. Um, and our invitation normally has an in invitation to the church. And after all of this and that application that makes me um, think about the things that I'm doing, I'm now uh, providing the opportunity for you to respond to that um, so what? Okay. So now we pray for one another and we put our, our um, feelings into action where we actually do something. Um, and then normally we also, we then open it to non-church members and we tell them now is the opportunity to respond to the gospel. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about that, but maybe also this is not the best time for that. But the sermon was really for the church, isn't it? So my, my invitation is for the church, I'm not saying it's wrong to say that you can respond to the gospel now, but what I am saying is um, when someone needs to learn about the gospel, you have a study with them. And it's not going to happen in this, the pulpit. Um, what I'm saying is that I can't, so someone called it inside out um, Christianity where we sit inside and we expect outside to come inside and then we preach the gospel. But the sermon is really directed to the church. Okay? Um, if there are visitors, that's great. But when the visitors come, that's not my chance now to convert the visitors. I'm supposed to go to that person and then we can have a Bible study and that is how I'm going to have that person respond to the gospel. Okay, so, yes, I'm not saying that don't have that, have that. Um, but just understand that um, my sermon is for the church. I'm encouraging the church first. And the visitor that comes in, um, go to the visitor. Afterward, speak to them, understand where, where they are, who they are, and then take a Bible study from there. And after all of that, I think then they will respond to that invitational that you do provide from the pulpit. Okay. So under um, sermon preparation, that's all the points that I've got. Um, okay, so... Um, we'll talk now a little bit about executing the sermon. And the first point that I have is write it down. Okay, um, So yes, and I think now we, we have slightly spoken about that. Um, there are certain brothers who are able, able um, to speak without having written their lesson down. And that, that's perfectly fine. For me, I need to write it down. Okay, um, So I, I've written it down and generally what happens, I've written down what I'm saying today, and generally what happens as soon as I start speaking, I don't even look at it anymore, because I've, I've been through it so many times that I know what I'm going to say next, okay? So, yes, my notes are here, the paper is full, but I don't need to look at it because I've prepared myself. Uh, but writing it down helps. Um, when you get to a point where you maybe forget what you're supposed to say next, and now there's an audience in front of you, and at that moment, it seems that your brain just decides he's going to just do nothing. Um, it helps then if you have that piece of paper that you can fall back on and you can look at. Right? Normally, um, my, my notes has a lot of pen marks on. And um, it's, there's certain things circled, certain things underlined. If I had a highlighter, it's highlighted. So that when I do just look at the notes very quickly, it's easy for me to find my place and to find, okay, this is the thought that I was continuing with and I can move on. Okay? So write, having it written down helps a lot. Okay? It helps as a fallback so you can see where you are, but it helps in more than that. And um, when I make my second point um, on, on this, I'm going to explain more why writing it down helps. Okay? So the first one is writing it down. The second one over here under executing our sermon is preach it 
before you preach it. Okay? Preach it before you preach it. So the very first time that you preach your sermon should not be when you stand in the pulpit. Um, I'm sure a lot of people think I'm crazy because a lot of time I'm speaking to myself um, and I'm maybe standing by the ironing board and I'm making gestures because in my mind that lesson's going through my head and I know, okay, this is what I want to say. This is how I want to say it. This is when I want to say it. Um, this is where I'm going to speak louder. This is where I'm going to speak softer. Uh, because it requires that at that moment. So all of this is going through my head and I'm preaching it while I'm doing different random things. And I'm driving in my car and I'm alone in my car and I'm talking. Um, but I'm preaching my lesson before I'm going to actually preach my lesson. Okay? So um, do that. Preach it before you preach it. The first time that you preach your lesson, lesson should not, I don't know why that keeps happening, um, should not be when you stand in the pulpit. Okay? Um, so when I look at the first two points, the first one that I had was to write it down. The second one was to preach it before we preach it. Um, when it comes to your learning, the more senses that you use in your learning, the easier it becomes to remember what you have learned. Okay. So if I write something down, I'm going to remember it easier. If I speak it and I wrote it down, even easier. If I, if I look, the, the more senses that's involved, the easier it becomes. So if I hear, I see, I touch, the more that I'm involving, the easier everything that I'm saying is going to stick in my mind. And also when I teach it to someone else, it also sticks in our minds. Okay? So um, write it down, even if you're not going to use the notes, but by you writing it down, it sticks in your head. By you speaking the sermon to yourself five, ten times, it sticks in your head because you've heard it already. Okay? So the more senses you involve in your learning, the easier things stick. Write it down, preach it before you preach it. Um, my next point, be simple, but not without depth. Okay? Be simple, but not without depth. Um, I think it was Uncle Al Warren that, that told us, when you explain a concept, explain it in such a way that a 12-year-old can understand what you're saying. Okay? Um, we can explain very technical things in very technical ways and lose everyone. Okay? But I can explain a very technical thing in a very simple way and bring everyone along with me. Okay? So when I am explaining something very difficult, maybe I'm explaining grace and I want to now use the Greek words and I want to say a lot of fancy things, I'm going to lose the brethren. Okay? But I can still explain that same concept in such a way that everyone can understand. Let me just put it like that. Okay? So I'm saying be simple, but I'm not saying that you don't have depth in what you are saying and what you are teaching. Okay? Um, so so when, we, when we read through something, if, if you have a book and you are reading in your book and you come across a word in the book um, that you've never seen before, that you didn't understand, what your mind does is it stops. And you can read the words after, but that sentence is not going to make sense because you found that word that didn't make sense. So what we normally do is we reread the sentence and then we try and guess what the word means based on the context. So we either do that or we look up the word and now we understand the word. Okay? Um, but while I'm reading, as soon as I come across the word, my brain kind of shuts off to whatever else is there. That same thing happens when you're speaking to an audience. So now I'm speaking and I'm using these big words and you don't know the words, you shut off and you stop listening to what I'm saying. Not because it was complicated, but because I used a word you didn't understand. I'm not saying don't use big words, but I'm saying use synonyms. So you, you use a word that is similar or has the same meaning as the big word that you used. The same way I just did now with synonym. Right? So um, you, it's maybe not a new concept, but maybe you're just reminding them of something that they once knew. So we all did English in grade 8 and we know synonyms, right? So... Um, Use the big word, but then after that, you say the same sentence in another way that helps bring everyone along to where you want to be. Okay? Be simple, but not without depth. Um, okay. <laughs> this was something that Uncle Roy Lothian at Tabs uh, said to us. Um, say what you need to say and sit down. Say what you need to say and sit down. Um, 
Uh, yes, I know at some congregations, your preaching slot is 45 minutes. Use 45, you don't have to use 45 minutes, okay? If you, you can be powerful in 20 minutes. And it depends on which website you look at, because the website I looked at said our attention span is 30 minutes, just are you. So I guess it depends on, on what resource you're looking at. But you, I'm not going to think that I am so interesting that I can keep your attention for an hour, okay? Um, so with, with my learners at school, I have them for an hour. I have each class, for, each class for at least about an hour. I don't stand there and talk for an hour because I'm going to lose them after maybe the first 10 minutes. So the first part, I, I deal with um, homework questions. So, so things that maybe have risen while you were at home and dealing with your work. Uh, the next part, I maybe introduce the new topic. And then the next part, I let you actually, I, I, I engage the learners, so I let them even come right on the board, or I let them do something. They must share their ideas. And the last part, they just sit and work. So I'm incorporating all these different things to use up my time. And when I teach Bible study classes, I feel like I can go longer than sermons because I have the brethren involved with me, and we are doing this together. So we can spend that 45 minutes. But when I'm going to preach a sermon, I don't think I can, I can hold your attention for 45 minutes. I'm not saying it's impossible. There are brothers who do it brilliantly. You can sit and listen to them and you forgot about the time. Uncle Mervyn does that perfectly. But I'm not going to think that I can do that. Okay, so um, say what you need to say and sit down. Sometimes we want to fill our time by repeating the same thing over and over again. And the people's just going to be like, I mean, this guy's done, isn't he done? So say what you need to say and sit down. Um, the next point over here, do nothing that will deter your message. Do nothing that will deter your message. And the next point that I have under that, we spoke about already, and the dress code. Now, yes, we're not going to find a scripture verse that says, come to church in a tie and a blazer. You're not going to find that verse. But I know if I go to Eastridge and I preach without the tie on, there's a sister over there. She's going to have a problem. She's going to sit there and she's going to think, this brother couldn't even wear a tie. And the words that I was speaking at that moment is lost. Why? Because I just didn't have a tie on. Now, I don't care if I have a tie on or if I don't have a tie on. I don't care. But I know that sister is going to miss part of my lesson because I didn't have a tie on. Yes, it's something small. It will grow with maturity and we will all learn that ties are not, not so important. But I'm not going to not wear a tie because it's going to deter the message in that moment. Are we okay? I know this is a big one. Everyone has a lot of opinions on it. But I know there's a sister that's going to have a problem if I drink from the bottle. So I'm not going to drink from the bottle. Because I know that this is going to have an issue with it. Is it a big deal? It's not a big deal. Is it going to change my life at all if I just pour out the water? No. So I'm going to pour out the water into a cup, uh, into a glass, and I'm going to drink it like that. Because it's not a big deal, but it will deter from the message at that point. Okay? Um, don't do things like play with a pen. People start watching you play with a pen. Uh, they see that the pen fell on the floor. And you have deterred from the message already because you were just doing something as simple as play with a pen. Um, chewing bubble gum, um, saying, um, um. So eventually people just start counting. How many, how many times did he say, um, now? <laughs> so don't do things that are going to deter from the message. Okay. Uh, the last point here, be bold, but be sincere. Be honest with yourself, okay? Be honest with yourself. There was um, one of the, the guys, I'm not sure who exactly, one of the guys that was at Sabs with us, he would say, the lesson that I'm preaching today is for myself. I'm preaching this to myself, but you can listen. That was something that he would say. Um, be honest with yourself. I cannot preach a lesson about something, and I'm not doing what I'm preaching about. I'm not saying that we are perfect, but I'm saying that if, if this is my lesson, then I'm going to do my best to try and live by this, and then I'm going to teach it. Okay? 
So be honest with yourself. Um, know your challenges. Deal with your challenges so that you can be a better preacher as you stand in front of the congregation. Um, those are all the points that I have under executing our lesson. Um, oh, there, there was one more thing in my notes. Um, Uncle, Uncle Fred at SABS, you would say you must be SLK, SLK. Uh, you must be slow, you must be loud, and you must be kind. Um, I think you always add slow, loud, and someone tell you, you should have a K because it will sound cooler if it's SLK. Um, so we be slow, so don't speak too fast. Uh, be loud. The brethren actually need to hear you. Um, there are times when we speak softer, um, maybe as inflection or what do you call it when you speak softer. Uh, but you raise your voice at times, you speak softer at times, but the brethren need to hear you. So be loud and be kind. Um, I think we can say the right things in a, a gentle way. Okay. So say what needs to be said, but be tactful in the way that you say it.